Adventures in Supply Chain Podcast is pleased to present this video episode of the Coronavirus and Supply Chain series with Deborah Dahl, founder of the Circular Supply Chain Network. Deborah loves supply chain, especially all about inventory. Prior to her role as principal, manufacturing product management at GE Digital, Deborah used technology to propel the supply chains and frontier markets to Industry 4.0 while at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now she looks across the industrial world and realizes the critical role industry plays in transitioning to a global circular economy, often called the circular industrial economy. In a circular economy, everything becomes inventory. In this episode, we talked about the following. Terms, sustainability, circular economy, what is the meaning of these terms? Does circular economy help the environment and the financial statements? Are there any particular industries that can benefit the most from circularity? What's the role of supply chain in circularity? How can supply chains start their transition to circular operations? How could circularity help with COVID? What can business leaders start doing today that will benefit their organizations? This episode is sponsored by USM Supply Chain. USM stands for Unstoppable, Scalable, Mindful Supply Chain. Check us out at usmsupplychain.com to scale up your profits together with your supply chain. And now with your host, Marcia, and her amazing guest, Deborah Dahl. Good afternoon, Deborah. A pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And it, your career is very impressive, all your accomplishments, but we would like uh, to know about your company and your role that is focused on circular supply chain networks. Perfect, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's been an interesting couple of years. I first came across the circular economy, the concept a couple of years ago, almost three years ago now. And I really spent some time thinking about the relationship between supply chain and the circular economy and how they go together. And so over these last few years, I've done uh, a few speaking engagements, written some articles, and here come supply chain professionals who are so keen to get together, explore the topic together, uh, and ultimately start to solve problems together. And so these last few months, perhaps because everyone's inside uh, and wondering what we can all do, um, there's been more and more asks for a space of convening to get together as a community. And so we are a small but growing network uh, of supply chain professionals fully focused on how can we do our part in the transition to a circular economy and an economy that's run in a more sustainable manner. That, that's perfect because as I was mentioning before briefly, before we started the, the episode, I think it's a perfect topic because we as supply chain professionals, practitioners, we should know more about circular supply chain. So this is a perfect opportunity. And since you have vast knowledge and experience, I think it's going to be very, very helpful. So to start, I would like to, to know more about the terms because we hear about circular economy, we hear about sustainability. So what are the differences? Because I know that some research and paper publications, they, they use them interchangeably, but I'm not sure if it is the right way to, to do that. Sure, it's a good question and one that comes up uh, often. Uh, and I'll even add one more layer on top of it. So we've got sustainability, which I think mm -hmm. is um, a broader term. It can cover uh, financial sustainability. It can cover environmental sustainability. It can cover uh, ethical sustainability mm -hmm. uh, and really starts to explore those three areas uh, and probably even more, of course. And the term sustainability originally started in how can we sustain it, what it is that we're doing. So how do we create a model that allows us to continue the way that we are? Another term that is being used more and more frequently in this space is regenerative. And there's an ongoing debate that uh, sustainability is not enough. We have to build a regenerative economy. 
Uh, and this is, of course, if we sustain the current path that we're going on today, um, we're actually going to run out of resources to use to fuel the economy. Yes. So we're actually going to be in a little bit of a tough spot. So this idea of regeneration, how do we make different material choices? How do we make different business model choices? How do we set up um, the right system so that users and consumers and companies can pick the right decisions to make inside? So that whole space is, is quite broad. Um, a great where uh, resource to go look at is the sustainable development goals, less well known in the United States, um, but fairly well known uh, around the world. And that gives a good idea of the breadth of sustainability. When I think about the circular economy, it's really quite focused on the environmental piece and the economic piece. It doesn't directly take on that ethical piece. Now, there's a side effect of a circular economy, which I'll talk about in a second. So we, we're in this space where we're saying, look, in order to run the global economy or a regional economy, the economy in your town, it requires inputs of materials and resources. Materials like plastics, like metals, like wood, uh, resources like heat, like water, like energy. And so it's saying, gosh, the way that it's set up today, which is in a linear economy, it kind of goes in a line. Mm -hmm. And at the end, things are thrown to landfill or someplace where they're no longer adding value. And the circular economy says, wait, that material has more value to give over its life cycle and more money to add into the global economy. So it's really focused on these two elements of how do we use the um, environmental resources in a way that can forever fuel our economy. So we have to make some changes in how we're working. But the side effect I mentioned is that um, circular supply chains are shorter. They're more regional, they're more focused. They find and transform materials regionally. And typically, if all the work is happening in your backyard, it'll be a more ethical supply chain and a more ethical operation because there's more eyes on it in a way. So I see it as a happy side effect, but um, that's the biggest differentiator between the broad term and uh, scope of sustainability and the focus of a circular economy. Yes, no, but it's important all the, the distinctions that, that you have made. Yes. And so you mentioned that is um, circularity has two focuses, right? It's like one is on the um, on the environment, and the another one on the financial aspect. So my question is related to that because we have in our heads that sustainability and the circular economy helps help both help the environment but we are not so sure about the financial aspect because for example if we use now that we are in this pandemic that we are using disinfecting wipes wipes have can be made of different materials one that is like eco-friendly and the other is the traditional one but we know that the cost is different so how can we have these two areas, environment and financial, aligned? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think one that's on a lot of people's mind. One of the risks we run in some markets is having the circular economy grouped together with green initiatives. And I say that with air quotes. There are some leaders today who prioritize making the right decision for the environment, the right decision uh, from a human resources perspective. However, there are still the majority of the world is still run on financial choices. And I think there's a risk of uh, assuming that something that's good for the planet has to cost a lot of money and we won't see a return. Now, there are a number of market failures, mostly including immature, still growing markets around secondary materials, for example. It's difficult to find secondary plastics that are the same form, function, and cost of the virgin plastic that you use today. So there are still uh, market failures preventing us from transitioning to a circular economy. 
However, um, renewable energy sources are now officially less expensive than mm. traditional fuel sources. And so these types of, when I talk resources, this is a resource, power is a resource. And so here we are starting to get into a new phase that it's actually less expensive to source. Now, the zinger comes, of course, that our entire infrastructure is set up the old way. Yeah. So here comes the discussion on, on cost. So I'll say two, two elements on this. One, if you are designing a circular business model or a circular supply chain, circular operations, and they don't have to go hand in hand, right? You can have a supply chain who's running on circular business models without supporting a business who is yes. injured in circular. So that's quite nice. Um, if you've designed this and you're not seeing a return, maybe there's a few design elements to relook at, or um, there may be a market failure and there could be potential to have collaboration across uh, industries in order to bring the cost of materials down. So there are some choices that can be made um, and it'll be really exciting when we get to that point at large scale and start to develop the secondary materials commodities market. Another element that's quite interesting that uh, we explored as part of a panel at the SAPIX conference a few weeks ago in South Africa, virtually, but you yeah. know, our hearts were in South Africa, uh, was the concept of the first mover disadvantage. So it's kind of tough as the first movers go into a new system, it's not an advantage, it's a disadvantage because they have to break out of the system uh, and build a new one. And so I think this shift of understanding what can we do in our own businesses um, to use fewer resources, uh, to reuse and reallocate as much as possible, uh, capture any um, waste flows coming out and figuring out how to, how to transition those. Uh, so in, industrial waste in the United States alone is a 57 billion a year industry. And so we've been capturing and selling industrial waste for a really long time. What's gonna happen though is that market will become very large and that will become the primary place where sourcing managers are going to find their materials tomorrow. Yes, yes. And do you think that there are any particular industries like those first movers? Which industries are going to be, for example, coming back to, to the disinfecting wipes? Mm, that is a demand from the market. So even though at, right now the cost is higher to manufacture that, well, there will be a point that the traditional wipes are not going to be able to solve the two. So it's the market that is asking for that. So what industries do you think are going to be these first movers? Yeah, it's a really good question. So there's there's industries and then there's sort of an overall focus. So I'll give you two answers. One, you know, a lot of the press and interesting sexy stories that we hear are consumer facing. Mm -hmm. uh, how far do your genes travel? How far has your food traveled? Uh, and these are important elements. However, the majority of resources used in the global economy actually happen in industry. So it's less about what's thrown away in a municipality around cities and more around what's thrown away in, uh, in industry, which of course goes to support humans in the end anyway. Uh, but there needs to be the shift in understanding of, you know, what happens when you walk over and flip on a light switch? There is a supply chain behind that. There's a physical set of infrastructure with spare parts and power and engineers and all of that uh, is supported. And so I'd recommend that we start looking at some of these industrial examples, although I realize they're somehow less exciting than the consumer examples. <laughs> but if we think about where to focus, so I firmly believe that circularity is a strategy, not a goal. So if you're trying to find money in your business, investigate a few circularity options as a strategy to get there. Today, I think on a lot of people's minds is risk. Supply chain risk for the first time has become a cool topic and we're talking <laughs> about it more than we ever have before. Uh, so there's two categories of this. One, there is a material security risk. If you use in your products today, but, uh, metals like gold, 
silver, tin, zinc, platinum. We have less than 50 years of these mineable metals left in the planet. So that means we don't know where to find any more 50 years from now. Uh, and that's not that long. And these elements are in a lot of what drives the economy today. So yes. there needs to be a, another plan for how we can either rebuild our products to not rely on these um, metals yeah. or how we can capture them from a source that's not a mine in the planet. Likely we'll be capturing these from gold, tin, zinc, platinum that's already detached from the planet and somehow already in circulation around the economy. So that's one category. If you will have some risk to what your operation is doing today. Mm -hmm. The second type of risk is if you have been disrupted this year, there's a good chance you could benefit from exploring <laughs> circular business models, which is probably most supply chains. So again, yes. if we think about a long supply chain that crosses many borders, or even doesn't cross borders, but you have a lot of stops. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know this. Every stop you make is another chance for risk. And so yes. the shorter your supply chain can be, you'll actually be more circular, chances mm -hmm. are, and you'll reduce that risk. So that's, that's where I'd say we, sh we should focus is um, using circularity as a risk mitigator. Yes. And um, this year, I think risk, as you were saying, was like the top word and we have... <laughs> identify risk that before we have never thought about them. So <laughs> you were very unique times. So Debra, what can we do from the supply chain perspective? We are in supply chain. How can we help? How can we start, let's say, first actions to take? Sure. So the cool thing is that I see a very clear relationship between lean or Kaizen thinking and circularity. Most supply chain professionals have been trained in lean management or a way of finding and eliminating waste in our operations. So if we think about lean as finding and eliminating waste, and we do that first, then circularity is about finding and monetizing waste, but it has to happen in order. You've got to reduce the waste mm, okay. and reduce the amount of materials and resources you're using. And then um, you introduce all those other components into a secondary commodities market. Another way of thinking about this is every operation in the world right now is a source of raw materials in a circular economy. Yes. And so it puts a different spin on it. We have value streams today and we have waste streams. Tomorrow in a circular economy, these waste streams become value streams. There's a different type of customers who are actually quite interested in your byproducts, in your waste streams. Um, there's, there's examples of reusing heat, reusing water that's already happening today. So that same kind of um, example will, will work. So I would advise to brush up on your lean. Um, I know this is gonna be tough right now because we all wanna hold more inventory. Uh, to hedge against the disruption we're seeing. However, you could still apply lean in terms of how much water you're using, how much energy you're using, uh, the consumables used throughout your processes. There are always ways to find uh, waste streams that are being produced. Uh, so you can start there and get a grasp on how much waste you're producing and where is it going. Almost more importantly, and I may have people may debate me on this, is to actually go to the front of your supply chain and go figure out what you're procuring in terms of, is it a virgin material or is it a secondary uh -huh. material? This is going to be more difficult than you think it should be <laughs> because your supplier has a supplier, supplier, supplier. Yes. And sometimes in today's supply chains, it's actually really tough to figure out where our materials are coming from. And so, just focusing on that, what's coming in. Um, it's up to us in the supply chain to be the stewards of the inventory that we purchase, the materials that we purchase, the contracts that we sign. And so knowing where these mm -hmm. materials come from is a really good first step. Um, even knowing, gosh, maybe we're only 2% using uh, repurposed, reused, recycled, reclaimed materials. Um, but just knowing the number, I think, it will take a tremendous amount of work, but is a very important baseline to have. Yes, great. And 
I have seen, I know that it's challenging because you are mentioning that first is like we need to have the supply chain right because we need to do all the work, identify the sources of waste, reduce them or eliminate them and then we can go further. But I remember like, I would say one year ago or two years ago, I was trying to find suppliers in China that produce plastics, but some of that plastic is recyclable, that it was from, from that source. At that moment, I couldn't find any. Maybe I, I wasn't doing very well, <laughs> that, that could be too. But this year, it was different. I found more than one company. So I think we are moving yes. forward, may, maybe not at the pace that we need to do that because it's challenging, <laughs> but I think we are on the right direction. Absolutely. I mean, it's very encouraging. We, you know, when I started first researching this space and I would go to an internet search for circular supply chain and I think two Google results, two, not two pages, two, two results. <laughs> and so now you Google it and you can actually find some resources and academia is researching it and there's enough literature to do literature reviews. And so even having a base awareness among the supply chain community has really um, improved. However, there are millions of us supply chain professionals around the world and we need more people to become aware of what's coming. You know, we've all been faced with um, some time in the year that something happens in the business, maybe sales did a big deal or a promotion they didn't tell us about. And then we go have to go play superhero and, and make up for all of the short planning time. This this with circular economy, we will transition. I don't know if it's going to be called circular economy by the time we transition, but we have, we're running out of materials. There's not a lot of other options yes, yes. except to figure out how to recapture it. And so this is one example of a time that, you know, we, we should know, and we have time to plan now, not many years. Um, McKinsey, the, con the consulting firm and research firm has given us till 2025. Gartner thinks it's like by 2030 latest. And so we're down to not very much time. If, if any of us have tried to do, you know, an ERP upgrade, yeah. that's a couple years minimum. And that's with existing technology and existing processes and existing measurement systems. Yeah. And we're talking about going to new measurement systems, um, bolting on analytics to existing systems, or maybe even new systems, new processes, new trading partners. Um, I mean, there's just, it's, it's a tremendous problem to solve. And I think if supply chain professionals were given the space to truly solve this problem, we can solve it. Yes, we have to partner with uh, material scientists and with the designers. Uh, there's a lot of partnerships to do, but in the end of the day, we decide what comes in and out of our operations. And so that's really the, the, the gate that we need to go through. And so if we change the game for what's allowed in, uh, we're going to change these markets very rapidly. And pretty soon you'll find many, many plastics yeah. providers who can, <laughs> who can maybe not even as far as China, maybe you could even bring that closer to home. Yes, yes, that's right. And, and I think this is a great opportunity for supply chain to show value that goes beyond achieving cost reduction, achieving cost savings, right? That traditionally is the function and, and the objective. We, we provide much more than that. And I think this is a perfect opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, risk reduction can be there uh, as companies are starting to commit to carbon commitments. Uh, supply chains can help make sure that that's not greenwashing, it's real, and we can deliver on those commitments. Uh, it also gives us a new lever to, to find more money, to find time. I mean, we're pretty much, I don't know how much faster we can go in supply chain. We're pretty quick already. <laughs> and so imagine if you don't have to start over every single time, if you could start with refurbishing, repairing, or repurposing your mm -hmm. products, you can go quicker because you don't have to start at the mine from scratch. Uh, and so when we think about long lead time, 
products or even products that are used quite frequently, uh, we've got a whole new set of tools we can use to really deliver value back to the organization. Yes, no, perfect. In, in particular, during these times, I see that circularity can play a huge role during COVID. Yes, so. very much, very much. Yes. Perfect. And what are your final thoughts, Debra, um, for business leaders? What would you tell them so more people can be on board on, on such important topic? Yeah, I think so. In addition to the go, go figure out what's coming into your supply chain and where it's coming from, also sit and reflect on the ways you've been disrupted this year. Now, some supply chains are doing incredibly well uh, and they've been able to field through this. Um, you know, overnight, we lost 80% of the world's air capacity. Were you disrupted or not? You know, how, how much has this year impacted you? And reflect, I'm not saying circularity is a silver bullet, um, but it does give additional tools to use. So that's one. Two, um, teach your organization about this. You know, I, I think once a supply chain professional hears about the concept of circularity, we can put the dots together ourselves. We can figure out what that could mean for us and what we can do. And so allow the space for innovation uh, to really solve for this. And I think that's the second big one. The third, of course, I'll give a plug, come and join us at the Circular Supply Chain Network. Uh, we're a fun network of, of, of professionals and we um, explore these different topics. What does this mean for, for procurement? What does this mean for inventory? What does this mean for transport? How do we get started? How do we measure? Uh, and we've got folks from five or six continents each time we get together. Mm -hmm. And so it's a fun global community uh, and you're more than welcome to join us. Great, of course I would love to. So what is, how would you say, what is the best way to reach the community so more people the audience can be involved and take action perfect yes you can find us online uh, we're on linkedin of course so circular supply mm -hmm. chain network listed there uh, our website is circular supply chain dot network and we get together a few times a month uh, to make to have these discussions or some webinars or some discussion groups like on zoom uh, we always have nice small breakout rooms, so you actually have a chance to speak with one another. Um, and we are right on the cusp of being able to put out uh, a couple perspective papers, um, help to educate. We've got visions for a learning space coming 2021 sometime. Wow, yes. <laughs> uh, because people really want to learn, and there isn't a space right now focused on circularity and supply chain. There's a lot on supply chain, there's a lot on circularity, but we don't have a space that brings the two together. So uh, we've got a, a good and growing group of uh, a team who's pulling this work together. Uh, and so watch our space, please come and join us and uh, you'll be among the first to know when we have a new opinion that you can come and, and debate with us and we can figure out <laughs> the future of this space together. Perfect, perfect. And the next event, so everyone can know, is on January 15th, right? We have events in January. We, our very next one is December 17th ah, okay. at 6 a.m. on the West Coast of the United States. So that makes it at uh, 3 p.m. in most of Europe. Uh, and so it works for the Americas, for the Europe and Africa time zone, for the India time zone. We have another time zone for the Asia Pacific region uh, because that time doesn't work very well for them. So uh, come and uh, check yes. us out. The times are on the site. Um, and if you have another time that you would prefer to meet or another way, or you'd like to have asynchronous discussions, uh, let us know and we can facilitate that as well. Perfect, perfect. And, and thank you so much. It, it has been a pleasure. And very helpful, very helpful, because as you said, it's key first to be aware. And then, of course, once we are aware, we will take action. Thank That's you so right. much. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you, Debra.